Hi, everybody. Jennifer Schaus here, and we're coming to you live today from Washington, D.C., and thanks for joining us in our 2024 complimentary webinar series covering the FAR, or Federal Acquisition Regulations, and we're glad that you're with us today. Okay, uh, a little bit about the series. As usual, all of our webinars are complimentary and recorded. Uh, the FAR has 52 total parts, and we will run through them sequentially each week on Wednesdays and Fridays at noon Eastern time, unless, of course, there is a holiday. Uh, the recordings and PowerPoints will be posted within 24 hours of the webinar ending. You can find the recordings on our YouTube channel simply by subscribing to it using the link you see on the screen. There is absolutely no cost to do that, just two seconds of your time. You can find the PowerPoint on slideshare.net using your LinkedIn credentials. And again, there's absolutely no cost, just two seconds of your time. Uh, we also offer sponsorship opportunities. So if you're interested in sponsoring the webinar series, please send an email to the hello at jennifershouse.com uh, email address. Okay, uh, how do you sign up for the series? Unfortunately, there is no bulk registration. You must register individually for each webinar. If you go to the Jennifer Schaus website, navigate to the section called the FAR, and you'll find the individual registration links. Also, the recording links will be posted here upon completion of each webinar, so no need to send us emails. Looking for the recordings, just go over to the section and scroll down to get the recordings. Or simply, like I said, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, please note we covered the FAR in 2020, so if you are eager to get a jump start, please find these historical recordings on our site. Navigate to the Webinars tab, scroll down to the section, the FAR 2020. Because it's been four years, many of these regulations have changed and been updated. So please use this as a reference tool only. A little bit about us. We work with established federal government contractors worldwide, helping them to navigate the market. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. Some of the contract vehicles we support are listed here on your screen. For more information, please visit our website. Uh, and for those that are uh, selling services to federal contractors, we also provide marketing and advertising opportunities. Uh, we can add extra muscle to your marketing efforts via our newsletter ads and webinar sponsorships to in-person events. Please mail us and ask for our media kit. And speaking of events, we hope you'll join us uh, less than a week away. It's five days away at the John F. Kennedy Center on Monday, February 12th. It's in the evening. It's 5.30 to 7.30. Our winter soiree will bring in about 300 plus federal contractors as well as confirmed attendance from Help over here. Confirmed attendance from the Air Force, Nav C, Nav Air, NSWC, the, N, the SBA, HHS, uh, State, and the VA. We've also got some great corporate sponsors and in kind sponsors. Please register in advance on our website under the section called Events, as tickets generally will sell out. And we hope to see you there. Again, this is Monday, February 12th, so Monday of next week. Uh, we've also got some classes coming up on uh, next week on Thursday, the 15th. It's a two-hour class with our friends over at the Virginia Apex Accelerator. It's a marketing class for government contractors. It is a very basic 101 class. You can register for this on our website, again, under the events section. <clears throat> we have some sponsored content webinars coming up. Uh, the Federal Forecasting app is putting on another webinar with us on Tuesday, March 12th. We're still waiting for the title for that one. Um, the same week of uh, that same week you can also then register for the agile ats webinar these are all complimentary on recruiting strategy systems and tactics for government contractors uh, and then my GovWatch is um, doing a great piece on rfp cliches debunked what government buyers really think they've done some conducted some surveys and they've got some great data to share we then have a two-part series on SBIRs and STTRs with Carrie Palmatier from Palmatier Law. Those won't be until June, but I uh, highly encourage you to register uh, for those. I think those are both, uh, we may have the day wrong, but I think those are Tuesdays, if I'm not mistaken, they could be Thursdays. Uh, but the dates are correct, June 20th and 27th. 
uh, in March, uh, end of March, uh, we're covering GSA schedules with the uh, Western Michigan Apex Accelerator. Uh, the registration link is also on our website. If anybody needs help with NASA Soup or DHS PACS, we can assist. Uh, again, drop us the email. Drop us an email to the hello at jennifershouse.com. Okay, let me thank our webinar sponsors because our webinars are complimentary. Uh, they have to be funded somehow. We've got to take time to put these PowerPoints together, subscriptions to go to webinar, uh, YouTube, and all and all the rest. So uh, again, we want to thank uh, the organizations that help contribute to that. So we want to thank our friends at Gov Events. They're the premier platform for posting events related to government and government contracting. You can find all of our webinars and our events on GovEvents.com, as well as our recordings from our past 600 plus webinars. We also want to thank Tom Johnson and his team at Set Aside Alert. They are the go-to publication for contracting opportunities for small women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, and 8A firms. Visit SetAsideAlert.com for more information. The Fairfax Economic Development Authority has an online calendar of events and webinars, and we want to thank them for posting our events and webinars on their calendar. The Virginia Apex Accelerator at George Mason University in Virginia offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to established government contracting firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore services, review homework recommendations, register for live training, and find useful links to agencies and other self-directed learning. One-on-one uh, -on -one counseling is, however, limited to eligible client companies. An appointment request um, are right now on very high demand, so they will be handled in the order that they're received. Uh, they've got plenty of online resources and group trainings, uh, which are free with no restriction on where your business is located. They've got some links, email addresses, and phone numbers there on your screen, so we encourage you to use those. The Greater Reston Chamber of Commerce has a monthly government contracting council meeting. Uh, it's always the last Tuesday of each month at 8.30 a.m. Contact Alicia Field if you have questions or want to participate. Uh, Bitspeed, you want help winning government contracts. Bitspeed can help. Users can find bidding opportunities from federal, state, and local government. Additionally, you can search for teaming partners, incumbent point of contact, expiring contracts, compliance matrices, and also proposal templates. Create your login today at bidspeed.com and please note Bidspeed as an official partner of the SBA's 7J Management and Technical Assistance Program. Okay, and FBC events are the ultimate engagement channel to bring government and industry together. 68% of government personnel report that they attend more than one event each year. That's a pretty high percentage. Uh, FBC has worked with government and industry for 45 plus years to create gatherings where ideas are shared and to help government achieve its goals. These include agency industry days, cybersecurity symposiums, tech expos, and offsite meetings. FBC provides full life cycle meeting planning and event management. With over 5,000 meetings under their belt, FBC has the experience, systems, and personnel to make your next event exceptional. Learn more at fbcinc.com. And GovBrew, please check out our friends over at GovBrew. GovBrew is the most read government contracting newsletter, keeping thousands of government contracting professionals in the loop with news, updates, and opportunities in the federal contracting market. It's all in a very fun and accessible email that only takes five minutes to read. It's 100% free to join goes out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 a.m. It's filled with great content, event postings, webinars, and more. Again, we encourage you to sign up at govbrew.co, uh, or you can use the QR code uh, that you see on the screen. Okay, uh, today we're covering FAR Part 4. We've got Bill Welch from uh, the Reston Law Group. Uh, Bill, it's great to have you with us. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to put myself on mute. And you just let me know when you are ready for the next slide to be advanced. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and advance one. And then um, that's a short bio, then advance, advance one more. Okay, let's start here. Um, before we actually start, uh, just a quick uh, introduction. My uh, name is William Welch, and I am a co-founding partner of the Reston Law Group, which was created in January 2023 by the merger of our firm, McMahon, Welch and & Learned, and the firm of David Brody at Dondershine. Both of these firms had strong government contracts practice. Together now, we have a practice in areas of 
business and corporate law, business litigation, intellectual property, and estate planning. Um, I've been a government contracts litigator for about 32 years. My practice specifically includes um, federal bid protests at the GAO, Court of Federal Claims, and the FAA. Also, I do size and status protests before the Small Business Administration uh, involving small businesses, service disabled businesses, and hub zone businesses. Today, we're speaking about the Federal Acquisition Regulations Part, FAR Part 4. Um, as you may know, the Federal Acquisition Regulations are part of the United States Federal Reg Code of Regulations excuse me, the Code of Federal Regulations. In, partic in particular, they are Title 48, uh, covering government acquisition regulations. The far as we know it, parts one through 53, are um, Title 48 of the CFR Chapter One only. Um, other chapters include individual agency acquisition regulations, such as um, the Defense Acquisition Regulations or the DFARS, um, which would be 48 CFR Chapter 2. In our case, we'll, we're discussing only FAR Part 4 of Chapter 1 of Title 48, commonly referred to as FAR Part 4. Speaking generally, FAR Part 4 contains 22 subparts. Many of these parts are simply contract formalities that most people would consider informal <clears throat> or even trivial matters, such as the contract must be in writing, the contract must be signed by the contracting officer, must be signed by the contractor or the contractor's authorized representative. In the case of joint ventures, must be signed by each joint venture member and must be distributed to the contractor and to various contract offices in charge of payment and oversight. We won't be discussing uh, each section of the FAR, um, uh, excuse me, each section of FAR Part 4 today, um, but uh, I've generally summarized FAR Part 4 into um, um, four sections. Um, um, from which we uh, will select um, four important uh, subparts for discussion. The first section includes the sections on contract formalities, as I mentioned before, such as contract execution, required signatures, distribution of paper copies, or more commonly electronic copies of the contract and all the subsequent contract modifications. Second is the government contractors, contracting officers responsibilities, which include the requirement for electronic commerce contracting where possible, contract reporting, identif identity verification, disclosure of information to the IRS, and disclosure of information to the Federal Procurement Data System or the FPDS, which we'll discuss in more detail later, as well as the safeguarding of classified information. Third is the uh, contractor's responsibilities, which include reporting taxpayer identification numbers, records retention requirements, reporting executive compensation, and reporting subcontractor data. And finally, um, in this section, um, reporting, uh, excuse me, finally in this section, the government system for award management registration, also referred to as SAM registration and the SAM requirements. Finally, I'll say a few words about uh, uh, two sections that uh, seem to have sort of been thrown in recently at the end of FAR Part 40, excuse me, at the end of FAR Part 4, maybe because they don't seem to fit anywhere else, but there's still significant requirements. 
if we could move to the next slide. I've selected four particular subparts of uh, what I would consider uh, to be the most interest and I think the most important. First of these areas include the Federal Procurement Data System, also referred as FPDS. Second, I'll discuss the contracting officer's requirement for safeguarding classified information through the National Security Program or the NISPO or NISPO. And third, I'll discuss the requirement for submitting contractor executive compensation, compensation and first tier subcontractor data. Finally, I'll discuss the system for award management or the SAM system and all the headaches that seems to have, that seem to have come with it. We could go to the next slide on the federal procurement data system under FAR part, excuse me, under FAR subpart 4.6, covering the federal procurement data system. The government is required to report contracting events, which are defined as any purchase or acquisition or any contract modification I would refer you specifically to the definition at FAR section 4.601 for the full range of coverage included um, in this definition of contract actions. But the federal procurement data system was established by the government to track and report contractor activities, including past performance, which goes back in some cases to 1976. The FPDS system. It's a web-based system maintained by the GSA, which receives the contract data and inputs it into a system that is available for use by contractors or any member of the public who registers for the site. It is not the contractor's responsibility to report this data. It is each agency's responsibility to report the data through their respective senior procurement executives acting in conjunction with the head of the contracting activity. In addition, it is the contracting officer's responsibility to provide contract action reports within 30 days of the contracting event. Department of Defense contract actions may be delayed as long as 90 days but otherwise the FPDS system provides a um, close to real-time data for contract awards. The FPDS system does not provide any information on classified contracts and does not include certain data such as contract, contractor proprietary data, procurement sensitive data or evaluation materials, cost and pricing data from the contractors or subcontractors. And um, uh, the data that is released must include all, uh, must include data from any definitive contract, that is any actual agreement um, between the government and the contractor. Um, that which includes any regular uh, typical government contract, um, any indefinite delivery vehicle contracts, any task and delivery order contracts, government-wide acquisition contracts or GWACs, and multi-agency contracts. It also includes GSA federal, federal supply schedule contracts, blanket purchase agreements, basic ordering agreements, and any other agreements or contracts against which individual orders or purchases may be placed. 
It does not include contracts below the micro threshold, uh, the micro purchase threshold. Any uh, non appropriated fund contracts. Any lease and supplemental lease agreements for real property. And um, federal grant detail. The FPVS system is an excellent source of information on agency awards over a selected period of time. This allows contractors, for example, to identify competitors' performances within agencies along with the dollar amount of the, competi comp of the competitor awards over the last few years. Contractors can also identify areas of contracting opportunities and may assist them in identifying potential teaming partners performing within contracts in an agency. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, I believe you know, this is the, um, the part two of the uh, federal procurement uh, data system slide. So if I could have one more slide after that. The next area I wanted to highlight under FAR Part 4 is the requirement for safeguarding classified information to contractors. The government has established the National Industrial Security Program, or the INSP, which governs federal procurement classified information, excuse me, federal government classified information released to government contractors. This program is specifically designed to cover contractor employees who must manage contract information as part of their contract responsibilities. This is different from the requirements for handling classified information by government employees. The National, the National Industrial Security Program is administered through and governed by the National Industrial Security Program Operating Manual, commonly referred to as the NISPOM, N-I-S-P-O-M. The NISPOM is administered by the Department of Defense and also regulates those non-DOD agencies that have industrial security agreements with the DOD. The NISPOM contains further details and is available online for anyone who wants to download it. Uh, next slide. The next area I wanted to highlight um, under FAR Part 4 is the requirement in FAR Subpart 4.14 which requires contractors to report the annual compensation of its executives. In addition, contractors are required to report data of its first tier subcontractor. Uh, just, an, uh, just as an aside, I will note that I was quite surprised when this came out a few years ago. Um, I think during maybe the Obama administration. Um, simply because um, um, I don't think it was discussed uh, for very long and not in much detail, um, generally speaking, um, but all of a sudden was um, uh, a responsibility put on the contractors to deliver certain data that most contractors would normally consider to be confidential or proprietary information. Um, but needless, uh, it, I mean, ne nevertheless, it, it is um, uh, it is uh, a definite requirement now. Um, I think everyone's getting used to. This section is governed by the contract clause that's required to be in nearly all contract uh, contracts with dollar amounts over thirty thousand dollars. 
in particular, section 4.1402 requires the contractor to report the compensation of its executive officers or depending on its corporate structure, its managers or its partners compensation. This disclosure requirement covers the prime contractor as well as its first tier subcontractor. The disclosure must also include, among other things, contract award data, the contract award date, uh, and the contract value. The subcontract award date um, Uh, and a description of the products and or services being provided by the contractor under the contract. It also requires the contractor to provide the executive compensation of its first tier subcontractor. Contractors or subcontractors who had gross income from the previous tax year of less than $30,000 are not required to make these disclosures. Uh, next slide. The last of the four areas that I wanted to dis to to discuss in FAR Part 4 is the government's system for award management, or its SAM registration or SAM.gov registration. The SAM.gov system was intended as a simple registration system accessible by the government and by contractors for those contractors that do business with the federal government by way of contracts, grants, or loans. Even companies who are um, interested in performing contracts should be registered in order to facilitate their ability to submit a proposal on a contract. SAM is a requirement for any entity to submit a proposal, a quote, a bid, or to receive the benefit of any contract event. Any contractor submitting an offer, bid, or quote must be registered in SAM before receiving an award. Um, if you could, let's see. Could you go to the next contract? Uh, the next slide, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, go back, uh, go back. There we go, okay. Um, contractors must update and monitor uh, their SAM registrations on a regular basis. These SAM registrations carry an expiration date and must be recertified regularly to avoid expiration. Expirations are automatic if the registration is not regularly maintained. In order to do business with the government, contractors must always proactively maintain their, uh, their registration. The SAM.gov site uh, has provided over the years many headaches and problems for contractors. Sometimes the problems um, are actually trivial errors or small bumps in the road, but sometimes these problems uh, problems can be extremely important. The SAM requirements include the contract clause that requires each offeror or uh, bidder or quoter for a contract award to maintain a continuous registration between the time of proposal submission and contract award, and then during performance of the contract and through final payment and contract closeout. It's important to note that SAM registrations must be continuous and not just active at the time of submitting a proposal and active at the time of receiving an award. Just two years ago, I helped a contractor protest its exclusion from the competitive range because the government took more than a year to evaluate a proposal. During that time, between the contract proposal submission and the contract award, the prime contractor's first tier subcontractor went out of business. 
Following that, the proposed subcontractor let its SAM registration expire automatically. My client, the prime contractor, had been selected for award eventually and uh, had always maintained an active SAM registration during the period of submission and contract award. But his subcontractor had not. Because the solicitation required both the prime and the first tier subcontractor to be registered in SAM, the agency declared that the prime contractor's proposal was ineligible for award. The agency did not care about the fact that the subcontractor had gone out of business, only that it had let their SAM entry lapse. The GAO agreed with the agency and found my client ineligible for award. It strictly construed the requirements of SAM.gov. Even more egregious is a case from just a few months ago at the Court of Federal Claims that also construed the SAM.gov requirements very strictly. In that case, the prime contractor submitted its proposal for award of a contract. <clears throat> Between the time of proposal submission and contract award, the company allowed its SAM registration to lapse, but only for a very short period of time. When it, dis it discovered the lapse, the contractor um, updated its entry reactive and reactivated its its uh, registration um, well before the time for award. The agency made the award not knowing of the brief lapse in the Prime's SAM registration. A competitor discovered the brief lapse and protested the award claiming the Prime contractor was ineligible for award. The court agreed with the protester and found the prime contractor ineligible for award. Again, strictly construing the requirements to maintain a continuous registration between the time of submitting a proposal and receiving an award, regardless of the fact of um, a very minor and short-lived lapse in that registration you must maintain your SAM registration continuously and without any lapses to avoid these problems. I wanted to mention a couple of other sections that I thought would be interesting and maybe enlightening. First is the last section of FAR Part 4 recently added, which would be FAR Subpart 4.22. FAR Subpoint 4.22 includes a prohibition on bite dance covered applications. Just to spell that term if you're not familiar with it, B Y T E D A N C E. Bite dance is a Chinese internet technology company headquartered in Beijing. Um, the uh, uh, ByteDance company uh, maintains several um, uh, social net networking services, including TikTok. Um, FAR subpart 22 prohibits any contractor from adding um, a, a bite dance application, including TikTok, to any government computer. Um, according to this subpart, no contractor may add TikTok to any computer or information technology the government provides to the contractor for use under the contract 
including any equipment provided by the contractor's employees, so long as it's used in the in the performance of the government contract, <clears throat> unless an exception is granted. This prohibition does not include any equipment acquired by a federal contractor incidental to a federal contract. Uh, the other section I wanted to mention briefly was uh, the ban on using products developed by Kaspersky Labs. You may remember uh, that Kaspersky Labs um, uh, did distribute um, uh, several um, uh, uh, virus and other protective type uh, software um, for virus detecting and other uh, computer protecting type software. Um, but um, FAR Part 4 bans any contractor from using any Kaspersky product on a government computer or using any hardware, software, or service developed or provided in whole or in part by Kaspersky Labs or any successors to Kaspersky to Kaspersky to develop products or information for the government. The U.S. instituted this ban in 2017 in response to allegations that Kaspersky had collaborated with the Russian federal security system to use Kaspersky software as a tool for facilitating espionage and the theft of sensitive data. Kaspersky has denied all of these allegations. Regardless, the uh, um, the uh, the ban stays in, in and it remains in effect. If you have any questions uh, or follow up uh, to this brief discussion on FAR Part Four, please contact contact me at my email address uh, wwelch at restinlaw.com. Bill, thanks Thank for uh, thanks, Bill, for the the nice presentation on uh, FAR Part Four. As he said, if you've got questions about anything in, uh, related to FAR Part Four that he covered or didn't cover, we've got all of his contact information here. And a quick reminder here that uh, all of our recordings are on the YouTube channel. It doesn't cost you anything to subscribe. If you hop over there, give us a like, leave a comment. Uh, we always appreciate that. And Another reminder to join us on Monday. Ticket sales are going to close very soon on this one. We're almost uh, a little bit over 300 people uh, as of this morning. So feel free to register. That's on our website under events. And again, that's February 12th, Monday at the Kennedy Center with these great government uh, departments and agencies, as well as our uh, corporate sponsors and our in-kind sponsors. Again, find that registration link on our website, jennifershouts.com, navigate over to events. And uh, they're all listed there by date. So just scroll down to February 12th. Uh, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us in uh, FAR Part 4. Thanks again, Bill. And we hope to see you guys on Friday for FAR Part 5. Thank you.